High in the Tyrolean Alps, hikers spot something strange melting out of the ice. A body. At first, it looks like a lost mountaineer. Tragic, but ordinary. It's been hailed as one of the century's most important archaeological finds. Then scientists date it, and the truth crashes down like an avalanche. This man died over 5,000 years ago. His clothes, his weapons, even the food in his stomach are still intact. But the real shock comes when researchers unlock his DNA. He wasn't one of them. He didn't match his neighbors. His lineage didn't survive into our time. Otzi the Iceman wasn't just another Copper Age farmer. He was a genetic ghost. So who was he? A traveler from a forgotten tribe? An exile shunned by his own community? Or the last surviving heir of a people erased from history? September 1991. Erika and Helmut Seaman are trekking along an alpine ridge near the Austrian-Italian border when they spot something sticking out of the ice. A torso, arms, a head. Horrified, they report it to police, who assume it's a modern mountaineer who met a tragic end. But scientists quickly realize the truth. This isn't a recent victim. This man walked the earth in 3300 BC. Suddenly, the world had its first perfectly preserved prehistoric mummy a time capsule of Europe's Copper Age. His outfit was built for survival. Leggings of goat hide, a deerskin coat, a grass-woven cloak like a primitive rain jacket, and shoes stuffed with dried hay for insulation. Next to him lay tools and weapons, a flint dagger, unfinished arrows, and most stunning of all, a copper axe with its wooden handle still intact. An object so rare at the time, it was worth more than gold. Overnight, Otzi became one of the most important archaeological finds of the century. But as scientists dug deeper, not into his belongings, but into his genes, they uncovered something far stranger. Otzi didn't belong. Before we dive into that genetic mystery, make sure you subscribe to Stone and Bone, where we uncover the hidden stories that DNA and archaeology are still whispering about our past. Otzi wasn't just a body frozen in the ice. He was a survival guide from prehistory. Every detail of his gear told scientists how people fought the cold of the Alps five millennia ago. He wore leggings of goat hide, stitched carefully together, a coat made of deerskin, and a cloak woven from grass that worked like a waterproof layer. His shoes were stuffed with dried hay, primitive insulation that mountaineers still admire today. His toolkit was just as impressive, a flint dagger with a wooden handle, a quiver with unfinished arrows, a birch bark container filled with embers so he could carry fire with him across the mountains, and most striking of all, his copper axe. The blade was smelted from ore traced to Tuscany, over 300 miles away, proving that even remote Alpine villagers were linked into far-flung trade networks. At the time, such an axe was a prestige object, rarer than gold, and likely marked him as someone of high status. And then there were the tattoos, 61 of them, running along his spine, knees, ankles, and joints. Not decorative, but therapeutic. Many scientists believe they functioned like acupuncture, aimed at relieving his arthritis and chronic pain. Combined with evidence of hardened arteries, the earliest case of heart disease ever recorded, Otzi was a man who carried both the tools of survival and the scars of struggle. For years, the assumption was simple. Otzi froze to death, but modern scans revealed something far darker. Buried deep in his left shoulder was an arrowhead, the kind of wound that would have severed a major artery. He would have collapsed within minutes. His skull also showed signs of trauma, suggesting either a fall during the attack or a final blow delivered after he was down. This was no accident. Otzi was killed. But why? The theories range from clan conflict to personal betrayal, from robbery gone wrong to a ritual execution. Some believe he was ambushed on the trail, others that he was fleeing his own people. His body tells us he had been in a fight shortly before his death. Traces of blood from multiple individuals were found on his weapons and clothing. And here's where I'd love your take. What do you think really happened on that mountain pass? Was Otzi cut down in a sudden ambush? 
or hunted because he was different from those around him? Drop your theory in the comments. I'll be reading them. Whatever the motive, one fact is clear. His death was violent, and his community wasn't as peaceful as we once imagined. But the bigger mystery came years later. Not from his wounds, but from his DNA. For decades, archaeologists assumed Otzi was a typical Copper Age alpine farmer. His tools, his clothes, even his last meal. Everything about him looked ordinary for his time. But in 2023, scientists at the Institute for Mummy Studies in Bolzano, Italy, asked a question no one had fully answered. Was he really one of the locals? To find out, they compared Otzi's genome with DNA from 47 other individuals who had lived in the South Tyrolean Alps between 6,400 and 1,300 BC. 15 of those people were his contemporaries, living around 3,300 BC. If Otzi belonged to their community, his DNA should have matched theirs. At first glance, it did. Like them, Otzi's ancestry was mostly Anatolian farmer, about 90% blended with a smaller portion of European hunter-gatherer. But when scientists zoomed in on lineages, the story unraveled. Otzi's paternal haplogroup, the Y chromosome passed from father to son, was G2AZ6208, a rare branch that had nearly vanished from Europe by his time. In contrast, every other man in the Alpine sample carried G2AL497, the dominant lineage in the region. Even more shocking was his maternal DNA. His haplogroup, K1F, has never been found in any other ancient or modern human. It died with him. On the surface, Otzi looked like his neighbors, but genetically, he was an outsider, carrying lineages that were already disappearing from the human story. To understand just how strange this is, you have to picture Alpine society in Otzi's time. These highland communities were patrilocal, Men stayed in their birth villages, while women married in from elsewhere. Over generations, this locked in male bloodlines. That's why almost every man in the Alps carried the same paternal lineage, G2AL497. Women, by contrast, brought diversity. Their mitochondrial DNA showed a mix of lineages, H, J, K, U, V, even rare subtypes. But Otzi didn't fit either pattern. His Y-DNA didn't match the local men, and his mitochondrial K1F was a complete ghost. That raises unsettling possibilities. Was he born in a remote valley, a relic of an isolated group that never fully integrated? Was he part of a fading tribe whose people were already vanishing before the Bronze Age even began? Or was he a genetic stranger in a society that valued belonging above all else? And here's where I'd like to hear your thoughts. In a world where family bloodlines defined your identity, how would someone like Otzi have been treated? As a leader with rare heritage? Or as an outsider never fully trusted? Let me know in the comments. Because when you look closely, Otzi may not have been a typical alpine farmer at all. He may have been the last voice of a people who were already disappearing. Otzi may have died alone in the Alps, but his belongings tell us he wasn't cut off from the wider world. His copper axe came from Tuscany, over 300 miles south. The obsidian flakes in his toolkit traced back to Mediterranean islands, and amber beads found near him point toward networks reaching as far as the Baltic Sea. This shows that even remote alpine farmers were part of continent-spanning exchange routes. Goods, ideas, and technologies flowed along these channels, tying small mountain villages into the larger story of Europe. But just a few centuries after Otzi's death, the Alps would face something far greater than trade. Around 2400 BC, waves of people swept in from the Pontic Caspian Steep, the Yamnaya, and their descendants. They brought horses, wagons, bronze tools, and new languages. But more importantly, they brought their DNA. The genetic shift was massive. Alpine remains after 2400 BC show up to 30% steppe ancestry, with traces reaching back even farther east to the Caucasus and Iranian Plateau. Within only a few generations, the genetic map of the Alps was transformed, and the fragile lineages carried by Otzi, G2AZ6208, and K1F were gone forever. 
Genetics weren't the only pressure closing in. Around 3300 BC, the Alps faced climatic instability. Glaciers advanced, growing seasons shortened, and food supplies became precarious. Survival meant competition for land, for resources, for control of the high passes. In this world, Alpine villages were clannish and tightly bound. Male bloodlines were defended fiercely, while women's marriages forged fragile alliances. To belong meant safety. To be different could mean vulnerability. And Otzi was different, genetically, perhaps culturally, maybe even politically. So when we look at the arrow wound in his back and the trauma to his skull, we can't rule out more than just personal conflict. His death may have been the flashpoint of broader tensions, resource wars, bloodline disputes, or even the targeting of outsiders in times of stress. This is the tragedy of Otzi. He lived at the very edge of a world about to change forever. Climate instability, social rigidity, and incoming migrations created a storm his people did not survive. He wasn't simply a man killed in the mountains. He was the last echo of a lineage erased by history's turning tide. Otzi may have lived five millennia ago, but his genome still whispers to us today. When scientists compared his DNA with living populations, they found his closest genetic relatives not in the Alps, but in Sardinia. Why? Because the island resisted later migration waves, preserving an ancient genetic profile that resembles Otzi's far more closely than mainland Europe does. His health also makes him startlingly familiar. Hardened arteries show he had cardiovascular disease, the same silent killer that strikes millions today. He had arthritis, parasites, cavities, and even Lyme disease. Strip away the primitive tools and you realize he battled the same ailments we do. And then there's his diet. His body shows he was lactose intolerant, unable to digest milk as an adult. That genetic switch, so common in modern Europeans, only spread after the Bronze Age when step herders turned dairy into a staple. In Otzi's world, milk was poison. In ours, it's breakfast. He's both alien and familiar, a man whose bloodlines have vanished, yet whose struggles mirror our own. When we look at Otzi, we don't just see a mummy in ice, we see a man whose lineage ended with him. His paternal haplogroup, G2A Z6208, faded from Europe. His maternal haplogroup, K1F, disappeared completely. No living human carries his exact genetic signature. That makes him haunting. Most ancient remains connect us to who we are. Otzi connects us to what we lost. He was frozen at the very moment his people were erased, preserved alone while history marched on without him. So who was Otzi really? A wanderer from a vanished tribe, a political exile, or just a lone man caught in the crossfire of a violent age? We may never know, but one truth remains. He wasn't just preserved in ice. He was preserved as the last of his kind. Tell me in the comments, what do you think Otzi truly represents? The relic of an extinct people or simply one man's tragic story? And if you found this mystery as gripping as I did, make sure to like this video, share it with someone who loves history, and subscribe to Stone and Bone because the past still has secrets and together we'll uncover them.